Hi. In this part of the session we will look at AWS Architect Associate Certification Real Exam Questions. There is a high probability to find these questions in the real exam or similar. If you like my video don't forget to press the bell button and subscribe. I will create more helpful videos like this. Thank you. Question 1. An AI-powered Forex trading application consumes thousands of data sets to train its machine learning model. The application's workload requires a high-performance, parallel hot storage to process the training datasets concurrently. It also needs cost-effective cold storage to archive those datasets that yield low profit. Which of the following Amazon storage services should the developer use? 1. Use Amazon FSx for Luster and Amazon S3 for hot and cold storage respectively. 2. Use Amazon FSx for Windows File Server and Amazon S3 for hot and cold storage respectively. 3. Use Amazon FSx for for Luster and Amazon EBS provisioned IOPS SSD, IO1, volumes for hot and cold storage respectively. 4. Use Amazon Elastic File System and Amazon S3 for hot and cold storage respectively. The correct answer is. Use Amazon FSx for Luster and Amazon S3 for hot and cold storage respectively. Explanation. Hot storage refers to the storage that keeps frequently accessed data, hot data. Warm storage refers to the storage that keeps less frequently accessed data, warm data. Cold storage refers to the storage that keeps rarely accessed data, cold data. In terms of pricing, the colder the data, the cheaper it is to store, and the costlier it is to access when needed. Amazon FSx for Luster is a high-performance file system for fast processing of workloads. Luster is a popular open-source parallel file system which stores data across multiple network file servers to maximize performance and reduce bottlenecks. Amazon FSx for Windows File Server is a fully managed Microsoft Windows file system with full support for the SMB protocol, Windows NTFS, Microsoft Active Directory AD integration. Amazon Elastic File System is a fully managed file storage service that makes it easy to set up and scale file storage in the Amazon cloud. Amazon S3 is an object storage service that offers industry-leading scalability, data availability, security, and performance. S3 offers different storage tiers for different use cases, frequently accessed data, infrequently accessed data, and rarely accessed data. The question has two requirements. High performance, parallel hot storage to process the training datasets concurrently. Cost effective cold storage to keep the archived datasets that are accessed infrequently. In this case, we can use Amazon FSx for Luster for the first requirement, as it provides a high performance, parallel file system for hot data. On the second requirement, we can use Amazon S3 for storing cold data. Amazon S3 supports a cold storage system via Amazon S3 Glacier, Glacier Deep Archive. Hence, the correct answer is, use Amazon FSx for Luster and Amazon S3 for hot and cold storage respectively. Using Amazon FSx for Luster and Amazon EBS provisioned IOPS SSD, IO1, Volumes for hot and cold storage respectively is incorrect because the provisioned IOPS SSD, IO1, volumes are designed for storing hot data, data that are frequently accessed, used in IO intensive workloads. EBS has a storage option called Cold HDD, but due to its price, it is not ideal for data archiving. EBS Cold HDD is much more expensive than Amazon S3 Glacier. Glacier Deep Archive and is often utilized in applications where sequential cold data is read less frequently. Using Amazon Elastic File System and Amazon S3 for hot and cold storage respectively is incorrect. Although EFS supports concurrent access to data, it does not have the high performance ability that is required for machine learning workloads. 
using Amazon FSX for Windows File Server and Amazon S3 for hot and cold storage respectively is incorrect because Amazon FSX for Windows File Server does not have a parallel file system, unlike Luster. Question number 2. An application that records whether data every minute is deployed in a fleet of spot EC2 instances and uses a MySQL RDS database instance. Currently, there is only one RDS instance running in one availability zone. You plan to improve the database to ensure high availability by synchronous data replication to another RDS instance. Which of the following performs synchronous data replication in RDS? 1. Dynamo DB Read Replica. 2. RDS Read Replica. 3. CloudFront running as a multi OS deployment. 4. RDS DB instances running as a multi OS deployment. The correct answer is RDS DB instances running as a multi AZ deployment. Explanation When you create or modify your DB instance to run as a multi AZ deployment, Amazon RDS automatically provisions and maintains a synchronous standby replica in a different availability zone. Updates to your DB instance are synchronously replicated across availability zones to the standby in order to keep both in sync and protect your latest database updates against DB instance failure. RDS read replica is incorrect as a read replica provides an asynchronous replication instead of synchronous. Dynamo DB read replica and CloudFront running as a multi AZ deployment are incorrect as both Dynamo DB and CloudFront do not have a read replica feature. Question 3 A company plans to migrate its on premises workload to AWS. The current architecture is composed of a Microsoft SharePoint server that uses a Windows shared file storage. The solutions architect needs to use a cloud storage solution that is highly available and can be integrated with Active Directory for access control and authentication. Which of the following options can satisfy the given requirement? 1. Create a file system using Amazon EFS and join it to an Active Directory domain. 2. Launch an Amazon EC2 Windows server to mount a new S3 bucket as a file volume. 3. Create a network file system, NFS, file share using AWS Storage Gateway. 4. Create a file system using Amazon FSx for Windows File Server and join it to an active domain in AWS. The correct answer is. Create a file system using Amazon FSx for Windows File Server and join it to an active domain in AWS. Explanation. Amazon FSx for Windows File Server provides fully managed, highly reliable, and scalable file storage that is accessible over the industry standard service message block, SMB, protocol. It is built on Windows Server, delivering a wide range of administrative features such as user quotas, end-user file restore, and Microsoft Active Directory AD integration. Amazon FSx is accessible from Windows, Linux, and Mac OS compute instances and devices. Thousands of compute instances and devices can access a file system concurrently. Amazon FSx works with Microsoft Active Directory to integrate with your existing Microsoft Windows environments. You have two options to provide user authentication and access control for your file system. AWS Managed Microsoft Active Directory and Self-Managed Microsoft Active Directory. Take note that after you create an Active Directory configuration for a file system, you can't change that configuration. However, you can create a new file system from a backup and change the Active Directory integration configuration for that file system. These configurations allow the users in your domain to use their existing identity to access the Amazon FSx file system and to control access to individual files and folders. Hence, the correct answer is, create a file system using Amazon FSx for Windows File Server and join it to an Active Directory domain in AWS. The option that says, 
Create a file system using Amazon EFS and join it to an Active Directory domain is incorrect because Amazon EFS does not support Windows systems, only Linux OS. You should use Amazon FSX for Windows File Server instead to satisfy the requirement in the scenario. The option that says, Launch an Amazon EC2 Windows Server to mount a new S3 bucket as a file volume is incorrect because you can't integrate Amazon S3 with your existing Active Directory to provide authentication and access control. The option that says, Create a Network File System, NFS, File share using AWS Storage Gateway is incorrect because NFS file share is mainly used for Linux systems. Remember that the requirement in the scenario is to use a Windows shared file storage. Therefore, you must use an SMB file share instead, which supports Windows OS and Active Directory configuration. Alternatively, you can also use the Amazon FSX for Windows File Server file system. Question 4. A company hosts multiple applications in their VPC. While monitoring the system, they notice that multiple port scans are coming in from a specific IP address block that is trying to connect to several AWS resources inside their VPC. The internal security team has requested that all offending IP addresses be denied for the next 24 hours for security purposes. Which of the following is the best method to quickly and temporarily deny access from the specified IP addresses? 1. Modify the network access control list associated with all public subnets in the VPC to deny access from the IP address block. 2. Add a rule in the security group of the EC2 instances to deny access from the IP address block. 3. Configure the firewall in the operating system of the EC2 instances to deny access from the IP address. Block. 4. Create a policy and I am to deny access from the IP address block. The correct answer is. Modify the network access control list associated with all public subnets in the VPC to deny access from the IP address block. Explanation. To control the traffic coming in and out of your VPC network, you can use the Network Access Control List, ACL. It is an optional layer of security for your VPC that acts as a firewall for controlling traffic in and out of one or more subnets. This is the best solution among other options as you can easily add and remove the restriction in a matter of minutes. Creating a policy and I am to deny access from the IP address block is incorrect as an I am policy does not control the inbound and outbound traffic of your VPC. Adding a rule in the security group of the EC2 instances to deny access from the IP address block is incorrect. Although a security group acts as a firewall, it will only control both inbound and outbound traffic at the instance level and not on the whole VPC. Configuring the firewall in the operating system of the EC2 instances to deny access from the IP address block is incorrect because adding a firewall in the underlying operating system of the EC2 instance is not enough. The attacker can just connect to other AWS resources since the network access control list still allows them to do so. Question 5. An online shopping platform is hosted on an auto-scaling group of spot EC2 instances and uses Amazon Aurora PostgreSQL as its database. There is a requirement to optimize your database workloads in your cluster where you have to direct the right operations of the production traffic to your high-capacity instances and point the reporting queries sent by your internal staff to the low-capacity instances. Which is the most suitable configuration for your application as well as your Aurora database cluster to achieve this requirement? 1. Do nothing since by default, Aurora will automatically direct the production traffic to your high-capacity instances and the reporting queries to your low-capacity instances. 2. Create a custom endpoint in Aurora based on the specified criteria for the production traffic and another custom endpoint to handle the reporting queries. 3. 
Configure your application to use the reader endpoint for both production traffic and reporting queries, which will enable your Aurora database to automatically perform load balancing among all the Aurora replicas. 4. In your application, use the instance endpoint of your Aurora database to handle the incoming production traffic and use the cluster endpoint to handle reporting queries. The correct answer is Create a custom endpoint in Aurora based on the specified criteria for the production traffic and another custom endpoint to handle the reporting queries. Explanation Amazon Aurora typically involves a cluster of DB instances instead of a single instance. Each connection is handled by a specific DB instance. When you connect to an Aurora cluster, the host name and port that you specify point to an intermediate handler called an endpoint. Aurora uses the endpoint mechanism to abstract these connections. Thus, you don't have to hard code all the host names or write your own logic for load balancing and rerouting connections when some DB instances aren't available. For certain Aurora tasks, different instances or groups of instances perform different roles. For example, the primary instance handles all data definition language, DDL, and data manipulation language, DML, statements. Up to 15 Aurora replicas handle read-only query traffic. Using endpoints, you can map each connection to the appropriate instance or group of instances based on your use case. For example, to perform DDL statements you can connect to whichever instance is the primary instance. To perform queries, you can connect to the reader endpoint, with Aurora automatically performing load balancing among all the Aurora replicas. For clusters with DB instances of different capacities or configurations, you can connect to custom endpoints associated with different subsets of DB instances. For diagnosis or tuning, you can connect to a specific instance endpoint to examine details about a specific DB instance. The custom endpoint provides load balance database connections based on criteria other than the read-only or read-write capability of the DB instances. For example, you might define a custom endpoint to connect to instances that use a particular AWS instance class or a particular DB parameter group. Then you might tell particular groups of users about this custom endpoint. For example, you might direct internal users to low-capacity instances for report generation or ad hoc, one-time, querying, and direct production traffic to high-capacity instances. Hence, creating a custom endpoint in Aurora based on the specified criteria for the production traffic and another custom endpoint to handle the reporting queries is the correct answer. Configuring your application to use the reader endpoint for both production traffic and reporting queries, which will enable your Aurora database to automatically perform load balancing among all the Aurora replicas is incorrect. Although it is true that a reader endpoint enables your Aurora database to automatically perform load balancing among all the Aurora replicas, it is quite limited to doing read operations only. You still need to use a custom endpoint to load balance the database connections based on the specified criteria. The option that says, in your application, Use the instance endpoint of your Aurora database to handle the incoming production traffic and use the cluster endpoint to handle reporting queries is incorrect because a cluster endpoint, also known as a writer endpoint, for an Aurora DB cluster simply connects to the current primary DB instance for that DB cluster. This endpoint can perform write operations in the database such as DDL statements, which is perfect for handling production traffic but not suitable for handling queries for reporting since there will be no write database operations that will be sent. Moreover, the endpoint does not point to lower capacity or high capacity instances as per the requirement. A better solution for this is to use a custom endpoint. The option that says, do nothing since by default, Aurora will automatically direct the production traffic to your high-capacity instances and the reporting queries to your low-capacity instances is incorrect because Aurora does not do this by default. You have to create custom endpoints in order to accomplish this requirement. Question 6. 
An IT consultant is working for a large financial company. The role of the consultant is to help the development team build a highly available web application using stateless web servers. In this scenario, which AWS services are suitable for storing session state data? Select 2. 1. DynamoDB. 2. ElastiCache. 3. Redshift Spectrum. 4. RDS. 5. Glacier. The correct answers are DynamoDB and ElastiCache. Explanation DynamoDB and ElastiCache are the correct answers. You can store session state data on both DynamoDB and ElastiCache. These AWS services provide high performance storage of key value pairs which can be used to build a highly available web application. Redshift Spectrum is incorrect since this is a data warehousing solution where you can directly query data from your data warehouse. Redshift is not suitable for storing session state, but more on analytics and OLAP processes. RDS is incorrect as well since this is a relational database solution of AWS. This relational storage type might not be the best fit for session states, and it might not provide the performance you need compared to DynamoDB for the same cost. S3 Glacier is incorrect since this is a low-cost cloud storage service for data archiving and long-term backup. The archival and retrieval speeds of Glacier is too slow for handling session states. Question 7. A company hosted an e-commerce website on an auto-scaling group of EC2 instances behind an application load balancer. The solutions architect noticed that the website is receiving a large number of illegitimate external requests from multiple systems with IP addresses that constantly change. To resolve the performance issues, the solutions architect must implement a solution that would block the illegitimate requests with minimal impact on legitimate traffic. Which of the following options fulfills this requirement? 1. Create a regular rule in AWS WAF and associate the web ACL to an application load balancer. 2. Create a custom rule in the security group of the application load balancer to block offending requests. 3. Create a rate-based rule in AWS WAF and associate the web ACL to an application load balancer. 4. Create a custom network ACL and associate it with the subnet of the application load balancer to block the offending requests. The correct answer is. Create a rate-based rule in AWS WAF and associate the web ACL to an application load balancer. Explanation. AWS WAF is tightly integrated with Amazon CloudFront, the application load balancer, ALB, Amazon API Gateway, and AWS AppSync, services that AWS customers commonly use to deliver content for their websites and applications. When you use AWS WAF on Amazon CloudFront, your rules run in all AWS Edge locations, located around the world close to your end users. This means security doesn't come at the expense of performance. Blocked requests are stopped before they reach your web servers. When you use AWS WAF on regional services, such as Application Load Balancer, Amazon API Gateway, and AWS App Sync, your rules run in the region and can be used to protect internet-facing resources as well as internal resources. A rate-based rule tracks the rate of requests for each originating IP address and triggers the rule action on IPs with rates that go over a limit. You set the limit as the number of requests per 5-minute time span. You can use this type of rule to put a temporary block on requests from an IP address that's sending excessive requests. Based on the given scenario, the requirement is to limit the number of requests from the illegitimate requests without affecting the genuine requests. To accomplish this requirement, you can use AWS WAF Web ACL. There are two types of rules in creating your own Web ACL rule, regular and rate-based rules. You need to select the latter to add a rate limit to your Web ACL. 
After creating the web ACL, you can associate it with ALB. When the rule action triggers, AWS WAF applies the action to additional requests from the IP address until the request rate falls below the limit. Hence, the correct answer is, create a rate-based rule in AWS WAF and associate the web ACL to an application load balancer. The option that says, create a regular rule in AWS WAF and associate the web ACL to an application load balancer is incorrect because a regular rule only matches the statement defined in the rule. If you need to add a rate limit to your rule, you should create a rate-based rule. The option that says, create a custom network ACL and associate it with the subnet of the application load balancer to block the offending requests is incorrect. Although NACLs can help you block incoming traffic, this option wouldn't be able to limit the number of requests from a single IP address that is dynamically changing. The option that says, create a custom rule in the security group of the application load balancer to block the offending requests is incorrect because the security group can only allow incoming traffic. Remember that you can't deny traffic using security groups. In addition, it is not capable of limiting the rate of traffic to your application unlike AWS WAF. Question 8. A company has three DevOps engineers that are handling its software development and infrastructure management processes. One of the engineers accidentally deleted a file hosted in Amazon S3 which has caused disruption of service. What can the DevOps engineers do to prevent this from happening again? 1. Create an IAM bucket policy that disables delete operation. 2. Set up a signed URL for all users. 3. Enable S3 versioning and multi-factor authentication delete on the bucket. 4. Use S3 and frequently access storage to store the data. The correct answer is. Enable S3 versioning and multi-factor authentication delete on the bucket. Explanation. To avoid accidental deletion in Amazon S3 bucket, you can enable versioning, enable MFA, multi-factor authentication, delete. Versioning is a means of keeping multiple variants of an object in the same bucket. You can use versioning to preserve, retrieve, and restore every version of every object stored in your Amazon S3 bucket. With versioning, you can easily recover from both unintended user actions and application failures. If the MFA, multi-factor authentication, delete is enabled, it requires additional authentication for either of the following operations. Change the versioning state of your bucket. Permanently delete an object version. Using S3 and frequently access storage to store the data is incorrect. Switching your storage class to S3 and frequent access won't help mitigate accidental deletions. Setting up a signed URL for all users is incorrect. Signed URLs give you more control over access to your content, so this feature deals more on accessing rather than deletion. Creating an IAM bucket policy that disables delete operation is incorrect. If you create a bucket policy preventing deletion, other users won't be able to delete objects that should be deleted. You only want to prevent accidental deletion, not disable the action itself. Question 9. A car dealership website hosted in Amazon EC2 stores car listings in an Amazon Aurora database managed by Amazon RDS. Once a vehicle has been sold, its data must be removed from the current listings and forwarded to a distributed processing system. Which of the following options can satisfy the given requirement? 1. Create a native function or a stored procedure that invokes a Lambda function. Configure the Lambda function to send event notification to an Amazon SQS queue for the processing system to consume. 2. Create an RDS event subscription and send the notification to AWS Lambda. Configure the Lambda function to fan out the event notifications to multiple Amazon SQS queues to update the processing system. 3. 
create an RDS event subscription and send the notifications to Amazon SNS. Configure the SNS topic to fan out the event notifications to multiple Amazon SQS queues. Process the data using Lambda functions. 4. Create an RDS event subscription and send the notifications to Amazon SQS. Configure the SQS queues to fan out the event notifications to multiple Amazon SNS topics. Process the data using Lambda functions. The correct answer is Create a native function or a stored procedure that invokes a Lambda function. Configure the Lambda function to send event notification to an Amazon SQS queue for the processing system to consume. Explanation You can invoke an AWS Lambda function from an Amazon Aurora MySQL compatible edition DB cluster with a native function or a stored procedure. This approach can be useful when you want to integrate your database running on Aurora MySQL with other AWS services. For example, you might want to capture data changes whenever a row in a table is modified in your database. Hence, the correct answer is, create a native function or a stored procedure that invokes a Lambda function. Configure the Lambda function to send event notifications to an Amazon SQS queue for the processing system to consume. RDS events only provide operational events such as DB instances events, DB parameter group events, DB security group events, and DB snapshot events. What we need in the scenario is to capture data modifying events. Insert, delete, update, which can be achieved through native functions or stored procedures. Hence, the following options are incorrect. Create an RDS event subscription and send the notifications to Amazon SQS. Configure the SQS queues to fan out the event notifications to multiple Amazon SNS topics. Process the data using Lambda functions. Create an RDS event subscription and send the notifications to AWS Lambda. Configure the Lambda function to fan out the event notifications to multiple Amazon SQS queues to update the processing system. Create an RDS event subscription and send the notifications to Amazon SNS. Configure the SNS topic to fan out the event notifications to multiple Amazon SQS queues. Process the data using Lambda functions. Question 10. A solutions architect is working for a company which has multiple VPCs in various AWS regions. The architect is assigned to set up a logging system which will track all of the changes made to their AWS resources in all regions, including the configurations made in IAM, CloudFront, AWS WAF, and Route 53. In order to pass the compliance requirements, the solution must ensure the security, integrity, and durability of the log data. It should also provide an event history of all API calls made in AWS Management Console and AWS CLI. Which of the following solutions is the best fit for this scenario? 1. Set up a new CloudWatch trail in a new S3 bucket using the AWS CLI also pass both the as multi-region trail and include global service events parameters then encrypt log files using KMS encryption. Apply multi-factor authenticator, MFA, delete on the S3 bucket and ensure that only authorized users can access the logs by configuring the bucket policy solutions is the best fit for this scenario. 2. Set up a new cloud trail trail in a new S3 bucket using the AWS CLI and also pass both the as multi-region trail and include global service events parameters then encrypt log files using KMS encryption. Apply multi-factor authentication, MFA, delete on the S3 bucket and ensure that only authorized users can access the logs by configuring the bucket policies. 3. Set up a new cloud trail trail in a new S3 bucket using the AWS CLI and also pass both the as multi-region trail and no include global service events parameters then encrypt log files using KMS encryption. Apply multi-factor authentication, MFA, 
Delete on the S3 bucket and ensure that only authorized users can access the logs by confirming the bucket policies. 4. Set up a new CloudWatch trail in a new S3 bucket using the Cloud Trail console and also pass the as multi region trail parameter, then encrypt log files using KMS encryption. Apply multi factor authentication, MFA. Delete on the S3 bucket and ensure that only authorized users can access the logs by configuring the bucket policies. The correct answer is Set up a new cloud trail trail in a new S3 bucket using the AWS CLI and also pass both the as multi region trail and include global service events parameters, then encrypt log files using KMS encryption. Apply multi factor authentication, MFA. Delete on the S3 bucket and ensure that only authorized users can access the logs by configuring the bucket policies. Explanation An event in CloudTrail is the record of an activity in an AWS account. This activity can be an action taken by a user, role, or service that is monitorable by CloudTrail. CloudTrail events provide a history of both API and non-API account activity made through the AWS Management Console, AWS SDKs, command line tools, and other AWS services. There are two types of events that can be logged in CloudTrail, management events and data events. By default, trails log management events, but not data events. A trail can be applied to all regions or a single region. As a best practice, create a trail that applies to all regions in the AWS partition in which you are working. This is the default setting when you create a trail in the Cloud Trail console. For most services, events are recorded in the region where the action occurred. For global services such as AWS Identity and Access Management, IAM, AWS STS, Amazon CloudFront, and Route 53, events are delivered to any trail that includes global services and are logged as occurring in U.S. East, and Virginia, region. In this scenario, the company requires a secure and durable logging solution that will track all of the activities of all AWS resources in all regions. CloudTrail can be used for this case with multi-region trail enabled, however, It will only cover the activities of the regional services, EC2, S3, RDS etc., and not for global services such as IAM, CloudFront, AWS WAF, and Route 53. In order to satisfy the requirement, you have to add the include global service events parameter in your AWS CLI command. Don't forget. If my videos are useful to you, subscribe, like, and share. Thank you.